Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host, Yvonne Heath, author of the book, Love Your Life to Death, and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So today's a very special day for me. I am welcoming my beautiful friend, Anne-Marie Schrouder, for the second time on the show. Uh, welcome back, Anne-Marie. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm great. It's sunny. What's, you know, the good I start. I know. I know. Well, so Anne-Marie is a fellow Canadian and it is November. So we're not really used to this gorgeous weather and I am going to take it. The sun is shining. It is extraordinary. Going to make sure to get outside. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so the first time you were on the show was uh, following the murder of George Floyd Right. That was, it was just in the wake of that and all the devastation. And um, it's interesting, as I shared on that show, that the words you said to me that just really struck me were, this is not new. Yeah. And, right? And and so I have made the commitment, and I, I mean, this is what you do anyways, but I guess I just kind of dove in. Let me go back and say, <laughs> Anne-Marie, stand by, please. Her expertise lies in equity, diversion and inclusion, anti-racism, anti-oppression, as well as varied lived experiences. And I love your passion as it is mine. Your passion is to make the world a better place. Right. Know? Yeah. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. That's yes. Yeah. That and yeah. and that's what's going to make our world a better place. And uh, and I know for many many years you've been working in the workplaces to create that um, that change that needed change. So since our conversation uh, back then, I think it was like June, maybe 2020, um, I have stayed with my commitment to, you know, continue. This is ongoing learning and changing and understanding what white privilege means, mm -hmm. seeing what my unconscious bias were are as, you know, at the time it's like, well, I don't have any bias and I'm not like that, right? Yeah. No, it's, yep, it's we all humbling. Do it. Yes, it's it's humbling and to say, okay, uh, looking back. And um, one of the things that I am willing and we need to be willing to do is make mistakes, right? We have unlearning to do and we have learning to do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so you are, I just, I truly like, I love you for so many reasons. Number one, the path you have chosen and then since then, which you started writing before George Floyd's murder. Yeah, long before. Long before. <laughs> long before, yeah. Long, yes. Yeah, but yeah. Anne-Marie has gifted the world with this book, Being Brown in a Black and White World. I've read it. I have, it's mostly highlighted now. <laughs> There's so many highlights. I thought I have to stop highlighting, but it stirred me, Anne-Marie. And I would love you to share your journey of writing this book. What, what prompted you, what brought you to that place and, and what it has done for you and for the world? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I can't speak to what it's done for the world. Um, and, and it's funny that you said, um, you know, I don't feel like the work I'm doing is a choice. I feel like it's my work to do. I really, really believe that it's my work to do. Yes. Um, so I feel really um, grateful to be able to do this work every day. I love it. It's, it's the, you know, the good, bad and ugly, right? It, but it's it just, I don't know what else I would do. It just, you know. No, there's nothing else. You, you This is what you want. There's nothing else. This is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the book, uh, the book went through so many different iterations. The Coles notes version is I started writing about having a child mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and started writing that, you know, before I was pregnant and mm -hmm. the search and all that. And it has morphed into this, like nothing like what, I, where I started. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, so that book is still sitting in my computer. But in in writing that book, what what started to happen, and and I've partly believe partly because I'm a mom now, mm -hmm. so and of a brown child who identifies as black, and so all of my stuff, as we know, all of my stuff is like right right here, right right in my face. Um, so I'm grateful for that. So so in writing that book and in exploring sort of wanting to have a child and wanting to have a child with the same color skin as me because I had an experience of having parents with two different skin colors than me 
and um, and not so much with my dad, but with my mom, not having people recognize that we were related, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, so I, so I, you know, because I'm part of the LGBTQ two SI plus community, I could sort of figure out how I can orchestrate having a child with a similar color to, to me. And so that brought up a lot of, hmm, you know, like what's my identity and, and why is this important? And, 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 you know, you know, should it be important? And, and for folk, and for me as a, as a biracial individual and as somebody of color, it was hugely important to have a child that people could recognize as mine. Sure. And so that journey took me into exploring uh, race, I use quotation marks because mm-hmm. instruction. We want to make sure people um, dig into that. Um, so in that exploration, uh, I was sort of I was in that and and writing about that further. And then I thought I need to write a book for work. Like this, you know, this is what I do. I need. I want to. I want to write something that will help sort of deepen people's awareness and understanding and so do, 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 set off to write a book I have a methodology called the ABCs of inclusion and I'm going to write about that and then this stuff kept sneaking its way in yeah. sneaking its way in and you know Ben Ben was helping me um, write and and I'm like I want to write this but this keeps coming up and he's like I think you need to write that I'm like no I don't want to do yeah I don't want to do that mm-hmm. um and, and not that I, I, you know, I love to write and I think sharing our stories is important, but this is a business book. Yeah. You know? right. um, but, or, and um, in, in true spirit of who I am in the world, the both and not the either, or I now have a business book with personal stuff in it and poems. And I hope, I hope that it allows people to really feel the journey and sink into how important it is for us to have conversations about race and racism oh. and how the social construction of race has eroded the sense of belonging for many of us. Mm-hmm. So I hope that it's done that. That's, that's, that's uh, well, I can tell you as I can also not speak for the rest of the world, but I feel like I can speak for anyone who's read this book. I did sink into it. It stirred me. And, you know, I was not happy with you at three in the morning when I couldn't stop reading it and I needed to be sleeping (laughs) because I was just, it was so intelligent and rich. And I loved that you weaved your personal experience, right? And you said, you said at, it was terrifying or scary to do. You're putting yourself out there. And I just so appreciated it all because it's intelligent and personal and I think you know when we combine those two things like here's all you know what is race well race is fabricated actually and these are the reasons but then but then to take your personal experience and it's funny because I will say poetry I don't necessarily relate to your poems are just conversations mm-hmm. right like they were just oh like it wasn't you know rhymey rhymey and it was just yeah. <laughs> the way you write and it was like, oh, wow, I just, I could, I, I could feel myself in that situation. So it was, it was an emotional journey for me, which, you know, this should be actually, well, that's, what it be. That's, that's what the work has to be, right? Where there's things we have to learn. So we need to use our head mm-hmm. and unlearn, mm-hmm. but, but it's heart work. Like we mm-hmm. need to open and, and really embrace each other, you know, figuratively and literally just to, just to hold space to hear and share and listen and then move forward in a, in a new way together. That's. And to be okay with getting it wrong, to getting it wrong. And, you know, I also, I really appreciate it. And I, I mean, this is, I want everyone to know that this conversation is going to be so quick and this is just the beginning, right? Like this has to be an ongoing conversation and learning. And this is an invitation to do that. And you are an incredible resource with your website and everything that you do and your book. So I appreciate that because there's always the now what, right? Right. I don't don't ever want to do something like, okay, that was great information. Now what? No, you need to connect with Anne-Marie. But we can, this, this is ongoing learning. And the first thing that we need to understand is that race is not real. Racism is. Yeah. Yeah. And the impact of racism is is huge. For everyone. For everyone. For everyone in different ways. 
Yes. And, and so when you say race is not real, can, can you share what that means for, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. It's a social construct. And, and, and that's, those are fancy words to say that somebody was like, Hmm, wonder what this means. Mm-hmm. Let's right. And then, and then we, and then took that whole, took a concept, took, no, it wasn't even a concept. Um, the idea came about based on skulls that were found in different areas of the world, then named for those areas of the world. Blumenbach is a scientist in the 1700s. Um, and then inferences were made based on skull size and shape and whatever about human beings. Mm-hmm. And the idea of different races was created. Mm-hmm. Created. Created. <laughs> right? And and in, in the 1700s, like we know more about science now, blah, blah, blah. But, but because of that, because of that um, creation of the idea of different races of human beings, not human beings, one group with different skin colors, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, we went down a rabbit hole of, of valuing people differently. And, and the, the implications of that, you know, from colonization to the transatlantic slave trade, to what we see today in inequities in our systems is so devastating and damaging to specifically to people of color mm-hmm. and, and black people who are black, people who are indigenous and to the whole of humanity because we've separated ourselves, right? Okay. And then we do the us and them, mm-hmm. me and you, and we're better than, and you're not as good as. That, that hurts everybody. Yes. Right. So the so the, the the impact of racism and race as a social contract definitely um, is is heavily weighted, obviously, in to to impact people who are black, indigenous, and people of color. But everybody loses. Everybody loses. And I it's interesting because I've shared before. I I didn't grow up with understanding racism or like it didn't even make sense to me to judge someone by the, their skin color. I was so naive. And so I also have to, you know, oh, okay, I'm not prejudiced. Well, that's fine. And it's also not enough to just, I need to understand and, and the impact, the emotional tax, as you talked about, right? In, in schools, in, in somebody of uh, people of color wanting to be successful in a, um, predominantly white world or field and and what they have to give up to get there if they right? get there. themselves yeah if they get there if they get if, there if they get there so yeah and and I, I think the one thing that I've really appreciated in the last year and a half in terms of where the conversation has gone since George Floyd was murdered mm-hmm. is how the the openness to have conversations about the system Mm-hmm. Right? because we've had many we've had conversations over time about the system here and there mm-hmm. but much of the conversations have been focused on interpersonal like what does racism look like when you right when you when you're prejudiced against someone mm-hmm. um, or a group specifically but when we talk about systemic racism we have to talk about cultures of whiteness. Mm-hmm. We have to talk about white supremacy as a concept, not about mm-hmm. people that use the concept, but as a concept. And we have to look at what are we doing in society that reinforces the, that ladder of humanity or that color ladder. Isabel Wilkerson calls it the ladder of humanity that, that devalues people based on skin color. And, and we've been taught that in covert and overt ways. Right. And, and so... We're all swimming in that, and if you're if you're somebody black, indigenous, or a person of color, you're going to see it, you're going to feel it, you're going to know it. You can point it out. You can you can say how systemic racism shows up in education, in healthcare, walking down the street, in in you know looking for employment. But if you're not black, indigenous, or a person of color, mm-hmm. you don't see it. Why? Because it doesn't impact you. Right. Right. Because systems and structures are created with dominant group identities in mind. And in terms of skin color, white is the dominant group. So that that normalization of whiteness and not just about skin, ways of being, ways of seeing the world. Right. Look at what's look at look at our our history in Canada with indigenous peoples. Right. It's hard to look at with. It's it's excruciating. It's excruciating. Mm -hmm. And that's 
a, a, I can't even think of the right word, but that's a manifestation of, 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 of a culture of whiteness mm -hmm. and white supremacy, almost obliterating a group of people because this is the way you should be. This is the way the world works. This is what you should be learning. This is, and we know better and you don't. So we are going to, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's oh. that, <clears throat> a, that assumption of superiority that, that marginalizes people to the point of genocide. It's yeah, it is so hard as a white person. I and and again, I appreciate you know in speaking to you and Dr. Gans Ferrance and everyone who it, has a voice in this that just wants to create change without the blame and shame. Because as Gans said in the show when when I interviewed, we didn't create this. We personally didn't. It was we became part of it, and so we have two choices right? We can pretend it didn't happen because it's too painful. And I think, well, if it's painful for us, imagine for yeah. people of color, hello, or we can feel our hard, hard mm -hmm. feelings together and say, now what? And, and I love in your book, and, and we have to talk about both and because it's so wonderful, but we are all needed around the fire. Absolutely. We, all voices, right? Like I think, well, I'm white. What am I going to do? Well, white people created this problem. So <laughs> my voice is, is needed as well. And so I'm listening, I'm learning and more so than say, oh, this is awful. I've chosen to be an ally and be a voice for change because that's the only way I can even cope with the, <laughs> our ancestry. That's a way to, to, right? Instead of just staying in that dark, awful place of, oh my gosh, like this is our history, which has been mostly buried. Yeah. Right? Literally and figuratively. Literally. Literally. Yes. And, figuratively, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's a carefully constructed plan, right? Like if you're, if you're up to something and then you make it so that people don't know you're doing it, <laughs> there's something right. And, and, and the, the culture of whiteness that we live in has been hidden, right? It's designed to keep us unaware. Absolutely. Right. Um, Layla Saad talks about that really well in her book, Me and White Supremacy. Okay. Um, we're all swimming in it. We were born into it in these generations. Um, it's designed to keep us asleep and unaware. It's designed to privilege some people and, and, and it's designed to, to totally, you know, undermine others. Mm -hmm. But, but in our stepping into change, we have to be aware of that system. Mm -hmm. We have to be aware of the bigness of it the depth of it, the width of it. Like we have to train ourselves to notice what systemic racism looks like mm -hmm. in small ways every day and in big ways in our systems and everything in between, because that's what we have to chip away at. It's not just about how we treat each other. We have right. to chip away at the system. It's, it's, it's bigger than that individual thing. Okay. So let's, so systemic racism. So how I, uh, like a concrete example, people say, well, I will, I mean, systemic racism, I don't really understand how that shows up at work. How does that yeah. show up in the workplace, Anne-Marie? Oh, so one, one example of how it shows up in the workplace is, you know, take a look at your organizational hierarchy, the org chart that we like to call it, the organizational chart. Um, and take a look at where um, folks who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color are represented. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, there are higher representations of BIPOC folks in entry-level positions. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go in the organizational chart, the whiter it gets. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and other diversity, other diverse identities as well. Not just, right? But we're talking about racism. Um, that's one example. Um, some tangible examples, some other tangible examples are, you know, applying for applying for a promotion, having the skill set, not getting the promotion. But often the same person that applies for that promotion has been doing the work as the interim position while looking for that new hire. Right. right. So obviously qualified, qualified enough to do the interim position, right. not qualified enough. To, to be hired for that position. But then here, here's the best part. Wait, wait for it. Ask to train the person. Ah, yeah, yeah I hear that. So offensive. <laughs> it's just so right? Like, don't you just want to like, mm. so, Ugh. so that's all 
layers of awful, right? It, it undermines your oh. sense of who you are. It tells you you're good enough for this, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. quite good enough for that. But if you could just like, yeah, so those are two examples of how. Oh, and those are very powerful, work. concrete examples. And it, and I love when it, when I ask this, I love it because you can't unhear what you've heard. But we can <laughs> we can pretend that we didn't understand that. And now when you go, and I I want everyone go look at your you know the ladder at your work and and take notice, see how so because. The thing is, is that systemic racism is so big. And of course, everybody said, well, what am I going to do? Well, I mean, yes. every it is each and every one of our responsibility to be a voice for change, right? It's not going to, it's not just up, the government needs to change this. Yes, and we need to be the voice for change saying, Absolutely. hey, this is not okay. This is not okay. Um, another thing I wanted to just point out, and there's so many, and we won't have time to do it all, but, and I love our mutual friend, Candy Barone, mm -hmm. uh, saying, right, she's so wonderful and very passionate as well. And, and she said, you know, I don't see color. Right. And I've heard people say that a lot. And you think, right, I've heard a friend say that. And I said, what do you mean you don't see color? Like, that's just so odd to me. You did not notice that that person had black skin you didn't notice oh no I don't see color and it comes from a good place and I love I I think for the most part and I love that you say and that's the problem yeah speak to yeah. that because I think that that's really important yeah so so here's my theory about color blindness my theory is that um you know the famous Martin Luther King Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King speech mm -hmm. I have a dream, right and I, I I dream that one day my children will be judge on the on the content of their character not the color of their skin okay yeah. so here's my theory it's just a theory but um i think maybe we took that and said okay don't look at the color don't look at the color don't right. do and he didn't say don't look at the color no he said don't judge by the color right those are two completely different things so so somebody's skin color now again we have to look at the context that we're living in because of racism mm -hmm. Our skin color impacts our experience, mm -hmm. our reality, and our needs. It's also a part of who I am. <laughs> Just yes. like, you know, my hair and the fact that I'm female identified, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, so, how, so first of all, how can you not see something that's so obvious? It's like covers everything, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like it's right here. Yeah. So how can you not see it? Um, and then by and then by not seeing it, you take away a part of who I am and make it not important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I think what happened with the colorblindness um, theory is that people, because of the society we live in, because of racism, because of the color ladder or the ladder of humanity and the devaluing of people based on skin color, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. that we have been taught overtly and covertly in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I think when people say, I don't see color, they might be trying to say, I value you. Right. Even though blah, blah, blah. Okay. Even though I've been taught that. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that might be what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's lovely, mm -hmm. but we have to see people's color for all the reasons I just mentioned. It's a part of who we are. Um, it's an important part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. We see the world differently. We move through the world differently. We experience the world differently. And because of racism and systemic racism, we have to see color because we, we have to make the connection between somebody's skin color and their experiences and the inequities in our society that folks who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color face every day. Oh. It's just such a big conversation. Absolutely. Because here's the, you know, there are things that, I mean, I can say I have ADHD, I'm weird. I'm all of these things, but I, that no one can know, right? Like I, I don't have to share that with people. When you are a person of color, your, your difference or your, there it is. Right. So, so when we say, yeah, I don't see color. I, I think we're I think that acknowledging that beautifulness is is part of acknowledging who that person is. Absolutely. And it's funny because when I was picking my shirt today, I said, you know, I'm going to wear my shirt of many colors. There's black, there's brown, there's beige, there's red, because that's the world I want to live in. 
Yeah. Right. A beautiful world of many colors that I acknowledge the beauty of that. And I love that your philosophy when you talk about either or mm. that doesn't leave room for everything in between, such as being brown. Right. And so let's talk about both. And what when you talk about both and what does that mean to you? Both and um, comes from my personal healing around being biracial and, and I'll always feeling um, for most of my life up until very recently, like I had to choose mm. and, I, and I wasn't black enough for the black kids in school and I'm not white. So it, that left me feeling a bit like a ping pong ball, mm -hmm. um, wanting always to be more black so that I fit better. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and that same push, pull, either or polarization that I feel in my body um, is what we see in the world around race and also around many other things. Mm -hmm. So for me, that both end was a, was a place of healing that allowed me to, to step into and recognize that I don't have to choose, mm -hmm. that I am both. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what does that mean? So so that's, that's, that's my personal experience, right? So that I get to, I get to take you know, my blackness and my whiteness. And I know that both have shaped who I am and I don't have to choose anymore, but I hold them, right? I hold them. And, and also it, there's a combination. I'm also me, right? I'm not just a, a two things put together that you yeah. can split apart. I'm, I'm me. Um, in my work, what it means to me is that um, in all areas, but because we're talking about race, that, that, we, that we all have our work to do, right? Folks who are white have their work to do around systemic racism and dismantling that and understanding and learning and unlearning, as you said. And folks who are black, indigenous and people of color have our own healing to do around, you know, we all the do. impact, the trauma, yeah? Yeah. So we, we have our own work to do. And, yeah. and I firmly believe that we need to find ways and spaces, create those spaces, um, safe spaces for us to Everyone. share and listen and learn and talk and, and understand history. Yes. Right. History is so, so important. We have, we can't just be like, that's over there. We have to, to go back and, and see all to. the ways that, that systemic racism and, and white supremacy has, has undermined, eroded and, and impacted the lives of, people who are black indigenous and people of color we have to and i would like to end with your daughter's beautiful quote oh yeah everyone is awesome in their own way even when you are black and white <laughs> love her love you thank you so much my beautiful friend for being a shining light in this world again encourage everyone to read this book and take action so that we can be the change we want to see in the world so that is a beautiful safe place for everyone. Thank you. Bye for now.